I hope you've uh, been enjoying our conversations. We've got uh, one more, and I'm very pleased now to introduce uh, one of my colleagues at COS, Nikki Pfeiffer. Hello, Nikki. Hi, Terry. Hi, everyone. Nikki is our Chief Product Officer and began full-time at COS in 2015 as a QA engineer and uh, now leads our product and engineering teams. So uh, glad to have you with us, Nikki. Uh, we're also joined by Lenny Tatelman. Uh, Lenny is the founder and president of Protocols.io, a secure platform for developing and sharing reproducible research methods. Uh, Lenny's background is in genetics and computational biology, and he's an advocate for open research and reproducibility. So hello, Lenny. Lenny, are you with us? Hey there, Lenny. So, uh, Nikki, I wonder, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, the OSF, of course, about uh, open research infrastructure today, and we're going to be talking about the interoperability of OSF in this session with other research technology tools. But before we dive in there, I wonder if you could spend a moment or two explaining um, OSF from your perspective. You know, what are the, you know, maybe the top one or two things that you really hope that our audience understands about OSF? Um, you know, again, from your role as our chief product officer. Um, but also, if you wouldn't mind, I, I'd like to ask you to uh, explain a little bit more about the open source aspect of OSF too, and why that's important. Sure, great questions. Um, and so much wonderful uh, detail has been shared by others, uh, other speakers about OSF, but I, um, I'll try to add a little bit of, of different perspectives uh, to your prompts, Terry. Um, OSF, um, as we've been describing it, it has lots of uh, potential um, value in researcher workflows to support life cycle open science. And, and maybe that's the place I would go a little deeper um, in describing kind of from my perspective, what we mean by life cycle open science. Um, it really is end to end. It is providing the tools and the interoperability um, within the workflow across the different stages that uh, researchers are conducting. Um, so thinking about the planning stage, I've heard people talk about um, pre-registration as a mechanism for helping to be transparent about uh, the, you know, the study that um, someone plans to conduct. Um, and then also, you know, the opportunity to consider the evaluation aspects. I think Clark did a really good job talking about those. Um, and so the opportunity with pre-registration and the remaining aspects of the the workflow being open um, and available for further evaluation, but also um, interoperability, which we'll get into more as we continue this particular session, but that's that's really critical from a, a life cycle open science perspective, recognizing that across these stages, a lot of time can pass. And so um, having uh, tools that connect and can help support um, streamlining those pieces and the metadata and all of the relevant outputs um, and connecting them together uh, seamlessly as part of the life cycle all the way to the to the end state. We talked a lot about publishing in the last session, so I think that everybody understands um, the different incentives and 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 um, sort of models that are out there that make this challenging. But the point in that the entire life cycle being transparent really enables life cycle open science and some of the um, ideals that we've all been discussing our passion for and actually, um, you know, revelation that we're starting to see good indications that in some communities, these are beginning to take hold. Um, and then the, the the other question that you asked, Terry, uh, relevant to uh, OSF being an open source um, infrastructure, that's really like near and, and dear to, to my heart and I think many others as well. I think it um, really enables us to live a lot of the values that we aspire to um, when we talk about open science, um, the openness of the code and uh, the mechanisms that are handling all of the resources that researchers are entrusting the OSF with, 
um, being transparent and something that you can see and understand what the mechanisms are, how it works, and, and also know that um, you own that data as a user on OSF, as we, as we um, sort of modeled our terms of use um, and other uh, service agreements around that aspect. And, um, you know, you can always take it with you. There is no lock-in, there is no holding on to something that a researcher um, has, you know, their life's work has has developed and curated over, over many, many years. Being on OSF, that's something that um, I think is part of just the philosophy of the tool um, and the open source nature. And really, um, Long-term sustainability ties in, I think, really well to open source. Um, what we what we want, it, and as others have mentioned, it's a tool that um, you know I would love to um, to say that it's a it's a must-have, not a nice-to-have. And when that's the case, I think that it's something we, as a community, um, as a research ecosystem, need to support and sustain it so that it's here for many years to come. And part of that can be a shared investment in its um, capabilities overall, ma maintaining that and extending those to continue to support the different aspects of, of life cycle open science that communities need. Um, and so, you know, being open source means that others can help develop um, features and functionality, can help, you know, maintain the, the libraries and the systems that, um, that actually OSF relies on. Um, and communities can contribute to that um, throughout, you know, the, the, the journey with o that they're using with OSF. And so that's something we sort of have a shared investment together in the tool. Yeah, that's, that's great. Good, uh, um, close followers of, of COS might recall that uh, about 18 months ago or so, give or take, uh, we received a grant from the National Science Foundation to develop uh, what's called an open source ecosystem around OSF. Uh, and as part of that, that have, involves a lot of collaborations with research community partners, other research tools um, that you know interoperate or that link to uh, OSF through our open API. I wonder, Nikki, if you wouldn't mind going a little bit deeper into the notion of interoperability and I think generally our audience probably has a good understanding of why it's important for a researcher to be able to use multiple tools together. But, um, you know, from on a more conceptual, I guess, uh, level, why, why is interoperability so important? Yeah, great question. Um, there's a few uh, high level uh, aspects that I, I sort of think of when, when this question of interoperability comes up and and why it's such a critical investment um, that we're making, but also other other tools um, in the in the in the life cycle and the ecosystem are also um, participating in. Number one, it, and it, it was really said well by Felipe a little bit ago, but that enhanced collaboration research is a collaborative endeavor, um, and the interoperable tools kind of allow for that um, seamless collaboration um, across all the different. Um, aspects of research um, that researchers are, are looking at and working with. Um, and so I think uh, in addition to um, supporting the collaboration aspects, it also accelerates, I think, the process a little bit when you have things working together, you know, seamlessly and you're not having to spend time porting things um, that are not in open formats over to, you know, a different system in a, in, in a particular way. I think all of that um, just creates some some opportunities for um, efficiency. Um, I also think that uh, the ability with we're in working with particular outputs, specifically data, the op, you know the integrations enable reuse and harmonization and 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 you know opportunities to kind of connect data across. Um, and so I think the fact that we know research um, data has lots of different diverse sources and formats um, and, and being able to inter integrate those um, makes it a lot easier for researchers to analyze and extract those insights. Um, and I think uh, Clark actually got to this a little bit as well when he was talking about some of the value um, in OSF. And I think um, another important um, aspect that was also mentioned in the previous session, just talking about trustworthiness, provenance, reproducibility, 
all of those are enabled through some of the transparency that you can have when you can interoperate between systems. So I can point to my data management plan. I can then point to my pre-registration. I can have metadata and different resources that are in different tools kind of pulling and pushing across um, the workflow so that um, you know I can have a more standardized workflow and I can be really transparent and enable evaluation, but also just clarity of my process um, all along the way. Um, and I think um, one more, maybe two more pieces I, I would raise, um, you know, kind of getting back to the efficiency, one of the critical aspects, not just um, researcher time is, is an expensive and a valuable commodity that we want to preserve as much as possible. We don't want researchers to have to spend so much time on administrative aspects, but actually to get to the research that they are, you know, skilled and experts in. So I think that that um, efficiency is really critical to call out when you have interoperable tools, but also um, lowering the barriers. Um, I think this has been mentioned a little bit, but, um, you know, it can, it can be a high burden for someone to work with these tools, especially when you start thinking about access and um, accessibility, different, you know, translations and languages. Um, so I think that the more that we can integrate and interoperate um, those tools, I think we can reduce some of that additional effort um, and reduce those barriers. Um, and then I think that it makes it more cost effective overall. Um, when you're spending less time on something, um, and, you know, things um, can be manipulated with less tools um, and more open formats. I think overall you're, you're spending um, less resource, um, whether that's people time or, or, you know, true dollars on, um, you know, paying for systems that maybe don't integrate well. Um, I think those would be the major areas I would say interoperability um, is enabling from a, you know, high level value perspective. It's, yeah, I I hear you certainly on that, and I know that uh, you know working so closely as I do with you and your team, you're constantly thinking of how to optimize things that benefit the researcher, saving them time. Um, metadata is something that comes up a lot in uh, your your team's consideration. So, um, in 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 that regard, it's uh, researchers are always a front of mind for us. Um, so one of the uh, community collaborators uh, through our open source ecosystem, uh, I'm really pleased to uh, be able to speak to today, uh, Lenny from protocols.io. Uh, I wonder, Lenny, um, you, uh, if you wouldn't mind doing so, um, protocols is a unique uh, platform to organize and share research methods and protocols. I wonder if you could briefly describe it and after that, maybe share what the integration between protocols and OSF looks like? Of course, um, and just wanted to say uh, many thanks for the invitation to participate. I've been enjoying uh, li listening to the talks and discussion. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm a scientist um, by, by training and it was my research experience and frustrations that led me to co-found Protocols.io, which is in a single sentence, uh, a platform for uh, organizing and sharing your research protocols. Um, there are two sides to it. There is the uh, public side. If you're sharing your protocols publicly, it's open access, free to read, free to publish. Uh, and the business model for sustainability is charging for private collaboration if you're uh, an individual lab or um, consortium or uh, a biotech company that um, wants to organize and have internal uh, reproducibility. Um, so trying when it comes to academics, we're trying to um, we're trying to make it easier to share method details as you're doing the research um, internally. That's the internal reproducibility and make it easier to publish and get credit for your protocols and make the resulting research papers more reproducible by, uh, instead of method sections referring to vague, we use the slightly modified method of something else, uh, making sure that you can link to the exact procedure that you used and other people can build in it. So that's protocols IO. Um, and of course the overlap with open science framework is that, um, Researchers use multiple tools, um, and if you have your, uh, you know, thirty protocols from your team 
in protocols IO. Um, it is frequently, if you're also using OSF, is frequently something that you want to see in your o OSF project. Um, and um, having to download, like you can always, whatever tool you use, you can always get things out of protocols IO, download protocols as PDFs, and then go into your electronic lab notebook, Google Drive, wherever you are, and manually upload those PDFs into the right place. Um, but it's those, like Nikki was just talking about, it's little barriers, right? That just take extra time that you should be spending on research. And so the motivation and um, the integration between protocols IO and uh, OSF is uh, using the OSF APIs, the application programming interface uh, to connect and just make it easier for the researcher to uh, bi-directionally either send the protocols that you want to appear in OSF from protocols IO to OSF or get files from your project in OSF into protocols IO. Um, so just meeting the researcher where they are, making it easier for them and making sure that uh, we acknowledge that they use multiple tools and tools should, should talk to each other. I maybe want to pose a question to you that I posed to Clark earlier, and I could be revealing my ignorance here, but are there certain research fields that the protocols model lends itself to versus others? It's a great question. Um, we started thinking of ourselves when we launched in 2014 on our landing page, it said life science uh, mm. protocol repository. But when we, as more and more journals <laughs> and publishers connected to protocols IO, when plus one added us to author guidelines, we started seeing anthropology protocols, psychology, um, trials, and, and uh, we realized that it's much broader than just the biomedical life science field. So we changed from just life science repository to research <clears throat> research method repository uh, on, the, on the landing page. So the answer to your question is that there is a bias historically from me being a geneticist and you know the communities that we initially reached out to, there is a bias towards um, the life science uh, in, ter in terms of, if you look at the 18,000 public protocols that have been shared on protocols IO, there is a bias towards life science, but we have many examples from physics, anthropology, as I said, and just political science. Um, so it it's much broader than that. Thank you. Uh, Nikki, I thought I'd turn back to you and ask if, uh, you know, when your team is working with a research community partner like protocols.io. What are some considerations that your team takes into account beyond the technical or like the software development? So for instance, how does COS identify partners to work with on this effort? Yeah, I'm, it's a great question. Um, I think there's lots of different things that we look at, and I think there's a spectrum of how to sort of evaluate these things. Um, I mean, obviously, we want to look for a clear community need. Um, so in the case of protocols.io, for example, their researchers were um, seeking, you know, this additional integration, um, because many of them were working with OSF. And so, you know, we were also hearing um, from OSF users the same requests, like, oh, it'd be cool if, if, if you could work with this tool because it's heavily used in our workflows and we just streamline our our day-to-day, -day, right? We just make life easier for them. Um, so I think a clear community need and request for um, certain tools to kind of interoperate together or to be integrated in certain ways, I think that's um a clear, you know, when that's happening, we're listening and we really want to be um, attentive to that. Um, I think, uh, you know, the the tool itself, um, we try to do some assessment of that. So uh, always looking at the technical components of a tool. And, um, you know, I think we're looking for things that use common um, standards. So standard, you know, open APIs, RESTful APIs. We want to make sure that, you um, 
when we're passing um, any sort of data back and forth that we're following, you know, security standards and, and the appropriate protocols for, for any PII type of data, actually, we, we try to use OAuth and, and not have any of that in um, that potentially is a risk. So um, those are all things that, you know, our, our engineering team are going to sit down and, and do some analysis of those tools just to see um, are the standards that are, you know, kind of best practice being followed. And a lot of times we've worked with different groups that are, are you know, they've built something out of an, a researcher need and maybe don't have all of that expertise on open source software development or security and different things like that. So we've actually worked a, uh, with several groups to, to bring um, some of that expertise and, and, to, and knowledge into how their tools are being developed. Um, and then I guess the, um, the other things is sort of want to always be cognizant of long-term um, sustainability uh, when we build some sort of integration that's always going to be um, investment of people's time and resources. Um, and so we just want to be sure that um, when we're going to put forth effort to, to make those connections that, um, you know, those tools are going to be around because um, what will happen is users will start to use them and rely on them just like, you know, you're hearing in other um, stories that were told earlier, this has just become essential. And so we would want um, something to, to not be here tomorrow that has been um, deemed critical for someone. Um, but we can also work to, to find ways to support long-term um, sustainability as well, working with different communities. Um, and I guess um, the only other thing I would say is, um, you know, the opportunity, like with protocols.io, we, we're, we're now tool developers and maintainers, Lenny and I. And so we we also not only want to look at, you know, we've met a need that, you know, has provided a solution for, for the research community to be more open, transparent, rigorous. Those are all, you know, huge wins um, when we can do something like this. But we also want to just continue to innovate on that over time. So, um, you know, understanding how this integration is being used, it maybe started off to just just pass a protocol back and forth, but there may be opportunities to actually enable further innovation in those workflows, um, make things even easier. So thinking about the metadata that's being collected on one of these platforms being used to inform downstream, um, you know, outputs and different aspects of the research workflow. And how could we talk about uh, sharing more of that information across our platforms to just continue to innovate on efficiency um, and, you know, the overall effort that researchers are going through to share um, their research and outputs. So um, I think those are, you know, a few things that we're always um, looking at and looking at the adoption over time and, and, and utilization of that, how to make things um, even more intuitive or, or easier to use, um, collecting that feedback from, from all angles and, and trying to support um, continuous improvement. Lenny, I wonder if you sense the same sort of um, opportunity with metadata that Nikki was just describing, um, because from my understanding, metadata does seem like a very valuable uh, uh, and necessary um, uh, category of resource, but one that is maybe underutilized or underutilized might not be the right word to use, but um, just the capacity to manage it and to integrate it into other aspects of the research workflow is um, it's pretty onerous sometimes. So I wonder, yeah, I wonder if you, uh, if you share Nikki's um, sort of sense there. So they're, they're actually, I was smiling at some points as Nikki was talking, but a lot of the things resonated um, and sort of be before metadata, it was interesting for me to hear how did how does all self choose who to integrate with, who to approach? And it is based on requests from researchers. Um, and it resonated a lot because um, for us, it was very similar. It was people using OSF and protocols IO and asking us, do you have an integration? Could you have an integration? It was universities that we were talking to about uh, having an institutional membership, just like uh, Center for Open Science has with OSF. And the librarians asking us, oh, we are, you know, uh, members of OSF. Um, do you have an integration with them? And it's important that uh, it's important that 
uh, platforms have APIs, but just having an API doesn't mean that there is a connection, right? Um, when it comes to the programming interface, someone still has to put resources towards it. There has to be a partnership. And what I wanted to highlight for the people that are listening is that if you hear, you know, how does OSF prioritize? How does Protocols IO prioritize? Who to connect with? Um, the researcher voice, the user voice carries a lot of weight, right? So um, asking the tools that you're using, right? The software, the platforms, asking them, do you have this? Could you add it? Um, that helps to prioritize because we know how many people are using protocols IO, but we don't know. There's a lot of electronic lab notebooks, Google Drive, OSF, Dropbox, like where are the researchers? What do they need? You could seize all development and innovation that Nick is talking about and just integrate. Um, so prioritizing is important. And I, th I just wanted to highlight that uh, the researcher voice matters a lot for which integrations actually happen. So don't forget that if you're listening to this. Um, and the other thing is because we all as scientists, as researchers use different tools, when you adopt a new tool, um, Nikki mentioned sustainability. Um, I think it is important to think like, okay, my university has a premium plan right now. What if I move and I graduate and I don't have a premium plan? Or what if my university doesn't renew and it suddenly becomes something I have to pay for and I don't have funds? You should always have a question of, um, can I get my data out? Right? Like, are there integrations? Is this something that's part of the ecosystem, a tool that thinks about the need to um, enable using other tools and integrations, or is it just a standalone uh, silo box um, that you have to use that and it'll be really hard to pull um, your data out. So those are just things you should keep in mind when you're adopting something new. That wasn't an answer to metadata. That was just, uh, as Nikki was talking, I was thinking. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, no trouble. If you have any thoughts on med the metadata question, uh, fine, uh, great, but um, no, no, no pressure, certainly to answer, if none. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on metadata, but I think it may be too technical. Uh, <laughs> sure. Yes, it, uh, for those listening, uh, uh, you know, I'm in my fundraising role. I, uh, metadata is not something that I typically uh, spend a lot of time thinking about uh, beyond how to, um, you know, uh, uh, leverage it to, you know, for 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 support purposes. But um, yeah, I uh, it quickly goes over my head as well. Uh, so, um, Nikki, I wonder, uh, you know, in thinking of the, uh, I guess the maybe this a similar follow up question that I asked to Lenny, in thinking of uh, integrations, integration partners that we work with, beyond being driven by user requests, are there any other considerations? For instance, the type of research field that a tool uh, caters to, or um, I'm wondering maybe another example would be how a tool is used to manage data? I mean, is there any sort of priority uh, given, you know, how, do, how, do you, how does your team prioritize some of these things that, you know, otherwise would be uh, a very large landscape of things to, you know, to, to contend with? Yeah, unfortunately there's um, kind of not an easy answer to that question. And I, I guess I wanted to, just elaborate a little bit more on on what I said earlier, and then Lenny started to feed off of a little bit. Um, I mean, obviously the priority is researchers, um, but we also get requests, um, as Lenny was talking about, um, like at the institutional member level, that's um, actually something we've been um, looking at is, you know, a lot of times, especially with OSTP memo and other, um, you know, policy compliance needs, um, you know, there's a, there's a librarian or an administrator that needs to be tracking these outputs um, and potentially needs 
to put them in a specific repository at their institution to maintain um, their compliance or their level of ability to like report on and track uh, impact and things like that. And so sometimes, um, you know, integration with an institution's um, storage or repository is is a is a request actually that we are um, looking at currently and have have for some time and been working with some of our institutional members to enhance some of our current integrations with tools like um, Dataverse or Figshare that we already maintain. But there, you know, there's others out there um, that certainly would enable efficiency gains and and you know streamlined um, you know workflows by those types of in, of integrations. Um, and likewise with the ability to um, you know, have reproducibility of a computational workflow or workbench. Um, and that's not necessarily something uh, immediately a researcher might request, but downstream reuse um, collaborative types of, of requests. Um, you know, that, that's something that does come up. Um, all that to say, the prioritization is always a challenge um, when we are the ones that have to do all of the building of those integrations. And that's really where we've made a pretty major pivot. Um, uh, you know, over the years, we've we've tried this um, to, to work with other um, communities um, to enable their uh, developers and their teams to build um, their own integrations with OSF. And I think the more that we can enable that as part of an open source ecosystem of tools that work with OSF, then it relies less on our ability to prioritize or resource those efforts, but actually put it out there with good documentation, lots of um, opportunity to, to ask questions and, and even you know our team being available to provide code review and things like that. Um, and tests and things that they could run um, asynchronously on their own to, to check code before um, pull requests are, are submitted so that it could actually be integrated on, you know, the OSF everybody uses. Um, and, and, and those are the goals that we have. We're, we're working towards that and we'll um, be hopefully able to put more out there on that very, very soon. But I think that's the answer. It's, it's actually that we, um, we wouldn't, be the bottleneck to that priority where it's a single stream. It's actually opening up multiple streams of, of work um, possibilities so that communities can um, also prioritize um, for themselves what are what are the integrations they want to see with OSF and, and make possible, obviously collaboratively as much as possible with us, but also we want to be out of the way so they can do that. Lenny, I, I sensed a... Um theme of uh, quality assurance and what Nikki was just saying. I wonder uh, if you picked up on that at all, if you have any perspective from uh, from your role with protocols.io on that. Quality assurance in terms of the content? Um... Uh, yes, in terms of uh, code review and just, uh, you know, I, I don't know what it looks like when, you know, to, to work on an integration together, but I wonder if there's uh, um, considerations from your end about what you had would hope to see, uh, you know, just as as we develop, um, you know, our side of the integration, if that makes sense. Well, for, for us, for integrations, um, because we have biotechs, pharmaceuticals also that are using protocols IO, and they might have an electronic lab notebook they want us to integrate with. We've sampled a wide variety of um, integrations and. What's beautiful about the Center for Open Science, the OSF, is the well-documented API. And for us, that's always like the first question. Can we take a look at how easy will it be to connect? And there are legacy systems that don't know what an API is, and it's a disaster sometimes. Um, but you know, the, the community should be pushing for the 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 participants in this ecosystem, the providers, to have APIs to encourage integration, right, and to remove the friction and barriers for the researchers that are using the tools. Um, and so for us, that that's a big question. Um, how modern is the system, and do they welcome, do they have integrations, and do they have a well-documented API, and it can be a disaster. Um, 
if, if they don't. So with OSEF, it was kind of a no-brainer. Um, I also wanted to say, though, just going back to some of the um, points that Nikki made in terms of barriers and meeting the researcher where the researcher is, one of the things I really like about Center for Open Science is that it's not just advocacy and highlighting um, challenges and what and problems and what we should be doing better, but it's also teaching people how to do things better with the training and reproducibility. And that's very near and dear to my heart and to the approach of Protocols IO as well. Um, but also just like OSF itself, right? Building tools to make it possible to do more open science, to do more reproducible science um, and connecting those tools to make it easier, right? To publish in a more rigorous way. Um, and the, the reason I think a lot about this is that I've spent 10 years at the bench myself and I never had enough time. Um, more experiments that I wanted to do. <clears throat> There's never enough hours in the day, both as a student, as a postdoc. And I've seen um, studies that show that over the last like 30 years, the bar for your first author paper as a graduate student has gotten higher. It takes more years, more time during your PhD to get your first paper out, um, which is interesting. Like we have all these high throughput tools and kits and technology, but it doesn't mean that you just now work more efficiently and can get the paper of 30 years ago done in two months instead of two years. The bar has shifted more than proportionately. And so it takes scientists more time to get their work published than it did before. So it's higher expectations. And at the same time, we're now aware that we should be publishing in a better way. And it's sort of a combination of things where we're expecting more from a paper in terms of the work that needs to go in. And then we're also asking to make it more rigorous, more reproducible, to share the code protocols. And I keep thinking about the poor student that what, you know, uh, has to do more with the same amount of time during the PhD. And when they're publishing has challenges like, where do I find the time? Because to share data well, to share it well, you have to you know, add the metadata and you have to comment your code and you have to put the protocol into protocols. I would, like these things always take time and the better you do it, the more time they take. Um, and so there is some tension and conflict there. And I think that the more tools like ours can reduce those barriers, um, if we can save you time as a researcher and make your life easier as you do the work and then make it easier to publish, right? If instead of it being a burden, if instead of you using a tool just at publication time, if you're using it as you're doing research and then it makes publishing actually easier rather than harder, you're a friend of a researcher. Um, and so for me, that's sort of the North Star for um, what we want to do right, in this ecosystem. And I like that Center for Open Science is not just there saying we have problems, but is building tools right, and listening to researchers on how to make your life easier. And I think that's what we want from the players in this um, and the providers listening to the researcher and always thinking like, how do we remove the, the protocols IO OSF integration? It doesn't magically solve your work and publish a paper for you, right? Um, it's a simple thing, but the more we can do those simple things that save you time and make it easier uh, to do, to, to communicate your research results in a more reproducible manner, um, the more adoption we'll see and the more rigorous the output will be. Um, so it's just wanted to highlight, I think, Nikki, you were also talking about the needs of the researchers and the barriers uh, to adopting some of the tools. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, we have actually reached the end of our time together today, so I uh, don't mean to cut our conversation short, but um, I, I really wanted to uh, say thank you, a very sincere thanks to you, Lenny, for joining us. Same with you, Nikki. I appreciate you both taking the time 
um, and chatting today. Um, I uh, also wanted to thank our audience for uh, joining us today and sticking with us. We really appreciate you uh, and your patience. This is the first time that we've attempted an event like this. And so I'm hoping that uh, we can make some improvements and uh, turn this into an ongoing series. So um, thanks very much to all of you. Uh, thanks to all of our guests and a special thanks to uh, my COS colleagues who helped me uh, facilitate this webinar. So um, more information coming from me in a follow-up message. So be on the lookout for that in your inboxes. Uh, visit us at cos.io and the open science framework is osf.io for more information. Um, beyond that, uh, enjoy your uh, Friday and uh, the rest of your weekend. Take care.